doing, our teenagers, our youth, hallelujah, our children, put your hands together again, let's appreciate our studios, the poetry, hallelujah, and all of you gathered here today. Happy Easter. Share with somebody next to you, Happy Easter. Make sure you see their smile as they say, Happy Easter. Hallelujah. Now, since we came here, we have been glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Emmanuel, God was always with us. And as we go to the world now, I want us to lift up our hands wherever you are. I don't know how much you love this Jesus, but I want you to express that love to him. Everything we have been doing in singing, in drama, in poetry, in film, is expressing that love, is, is releasing and giving up something to him. All the practice, everything that you have seen, it's not a show. People have invested their time. Now in one minute or two, lift up your hands and invest your love in Jesus. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Emmanuel, God who is with us. The Anointed One who is the Prince of Peace. He has come to save us and redeem us. He who knew no sin, he became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Lift up your voices, lift up your voices. If you can sing, sing. If you can praise him, praise him. Right now, lift up your voice, lift up your voice and, and express love. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I honor you. Lord, I bless your name. For there is no other kind of love, no greater love than this, that a man will give his life for us. That Savior will call me friend. That my God will come and, and, and be beside me and promise never to leave me nor forsake me. Lord, be glorified. Lord, be glorified. I will praise you, Lord. I will magnify your name. Full of grace and truth, the rose of Sharon, the beauty of heaven, the express image of God the Father, Messiah, exalted one. We bow. We bow. Be 
exalted Lord thank you Jesus words are inadequate to express the glory of this day the glory of a new beginning to mankind the glory of a new start, the glory of eternal victory, the glory of triumphing always, the glory of victory over darkness, the glory of victory over sin. This is what we celebrate today. You have that victory in Christ. You have victory over darkness, you have victory over sin. You have victory over poverty. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody who has received victory in Christ, shout a big hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to God. Please, you may be seated. Every Easter, I come to a point where it's difficult to express even what this means. And so today, please pay attention. We are approaching God's word. The Bible says, by faith, we understand that the words we are framed by the word of God. And so every time we come into this space at this time, we come before the power of the Almighty to frame our future, to frame our life, to adjust things, to put things, to create things. And as I share the word, please pay attention. I'm going to be reading lots of scriptures because today is Easter. Hallelujah. But I also hope to answer some questions. He chose the nails. I'll take my text from Luke chapter 24. And sweet Holy Spirit, I, I just depend on you today because, Lord, you are the teacher. You are the inspiration. Let the words we share today be revelation that abides in every heart in the name of Jesus. Luke chapter 24 is my text. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Hallelujah. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Hallelujah. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Tell your neighbor, I am part of the living. Because of Christ, I cannot be found among the dead. I have eternal life in me. Praise the Lord. The simple reason 
why Jesus Christ came into this world was so that man could regain what he lost. The simple reason why Jesus came was that man could regain what he lost. What did man lose? The right to be called a child of God. The right to be called a child of God. The right to carry the nature of God. Man lost it. Christ came to restore it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John chapter 1 verse 12. John was writing here. John said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, that right was restored to be called children of God. Now, please understand, that right could only be restored for man to again have the nature of God in a legal manner. Christ had to come to do it legally. What do I mean by that? Remember that angels cast Satan out of heaven. And he had no more right there. But they couldn't cast him out of the earth. Because the authority that exercised on the earth, it took from man. Man was given dominion. And by an act of treasonous rebellion, he gave that authority to Satan. And God is a righteous God. So if God had sent angels to the earth to take back that authority, Satan would have accused God. You know he's an accuser. And so because it was taken from a man, God had to become man to take it back for man. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. And so in John 3, 16, we find the scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Eternal life is the nature of God that Adam lost. Christ came to give it back. Hallelujah. John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill. And to destroy. He said, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Today is the celebration that nothing can be stolen from your life anymore. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Today is the declaration and celebration that if Christ is in your life, you are guaranteed abundant life. It's not just abundant life here is abundant life eternally the nature of God and that's why we can rejoice that's why we dance that's why when you are in Christ your head must never be bowed down hallelujah I said your head must never be what your head must never be bowed down in sorrow or defeat. Knowing that the basis and the very foundation of Christianity is that he died on the cross. He was buried on the third day. What happened? What happened? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Heaven can't hear you. Tell somebody nothing can keep you down. 
you will always rise. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Why Christ came? In verse 17, Paul had this revelation of Romans chapter 5, verse 17. He said, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. <laughs> For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see something here, and I've been jumping. And he said, he said, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. And the Holy Spirit told me, he said, what we are celebrating today is your justification to live. You can tell any devil, I'm justified to be here. Hallelujah. I'm justified to live. Death has no hold on me. Tell somebody, I'm justified to live. Oh, please say it like you mean it. Because he died in my place. Hallelujah. He took my sins. He took my sickness. I'm justified to be healthy. I'm justified to be wealthy. I'm justified to be wise. Is there anything in God that is desirable? You are justified for it. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my word. Do I have any Christian in this room? Woo! Glory. Glory to God. I want us to take an exciting journey into the legal drama that took place today. It's intriguing how God became man so he could legally set us free. In Adam, all men died. Oh, I mean, all men sinned. Praise God. In Adam, all men sinned. So in the world today, there are two types of human beings. One, you have one under Adam, and you have under Christ. Hallelujah. Two types, two types, praise God. You are under, you are either under Adam. When a man is born of any human, you are under Adam. Praise God. Without accepting God, who came as man and gave his life, you cannot have abundant life. You cannot have eternal life. This is the simple equation. And I'm going to, I'm going to explain it. Because at funerals, we do a lot of things. Amen. We sprinkle holy water. And we do a lot of things, praise God. But there is no repentance after death. When a man dies, the Bible says it is given to, for man to die once and then after that the judgment. God came so that we can receive life in this flesh. If you don't have 
Christ and receive him while you are in the flesh. You cannot receive him when you are out of the flesh. Hallelujah. If your spirit man is not recreated while you are here, it cannot be recreated when you leave the body. Satan and demons, they are all over the place. They are disembodied spirits. Why do you think Satan and demons can no longer be saved? They can't be saved because they are disembodied spirits. They don't have a body. And so they can only act under the authority of invading a body, of somebody allowing them to use him or her. Is somebody with me? Because legally, legally, to engage in anything on this earth, you need a body. Praise God. Praise God. And so even God had to enter a body in order to rescue us. Hallelujah. So let me give you a background story to all we are doing today. The disciples, because we are going beyond the physical. How many people saw The Passion of Christ, the film by Mel Gibson? Very gory, very, very, very emotional, very, the physical abuse Jesus went through. It, 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 it's traumatic. But let me give you the background story because in all the physical things that went on at the cross and after Jesus was buried, there were a lot of other things going on that we might not be aware of. The disciples all knew Jesus, the one who was born as a baby. The Christ of Nazareth, born to Joseph and Mary. They walked with him for three and a half years. They lived with him. They saw the miracles that he did. And they also saw when he was arrested at Gethsemane. They saw him carry the cross. Many of them ran away. They saw the crucifixion, how he was beaten to an inch of his life. They saw how nails were driven into his hands and his feet. They heard the words when he declared, it is finished, and he gave up the, the ghost. They saw how his body was handed over to Nicodemus and Joseph of, of Arimathea. Nicodemus brought the spices. Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea supplied the grave. They saw him embalmed in the tomb with the grave clothes wrapped around him. They saw the empty grave later. Praise God. And then they saw the resurrected Christ physically. All this were recorded in the Gospels. They ate with him, with his pierced hands. Thomas said, I, 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 I can't believe, I, I have to touch it. Jesus said, touch. <laughs> he said, but blessed are those who believe who have not, who have not you know, seen it physically. And they saw him ascend to heaven. Now all that they saw, which we find recorded in the Gospels, were just the physical evidence of something that happened. It became a historical fact and event that a man born in Nazareth claimed to be God died on the cross, resurrected on the third day, and ascended to heaven. But until the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, 
they could not begin to discern some of the spiritual things and significance of what they experienced. Actually, during the experience, you found Peter denied Jesus. All of them ran away because they couldn't understand it, but they could see it. And after the Holy Spirit came, revelation began to come. And that was why you have the letters in the New Testament, the letters written to the Christians explaining the Gospels, explaining what actually happened. There is such a need for this revelation. And today I'll just point out a few things. We won't be able to go through everything word, word for word. But in Hebrews chapter 2, for instance, the writer of Hebrews tells us that in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so he had to become flesh in order to overcome the power of death over us while in the flesh. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so death has no power over you. You know, I like the way late Dr. Miles Monroe put it. He said, when Christ died, Satan was struggling. Death, death was struggling to hold him. He couldn't. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He wasn't, he wasn't struggling to resurrect Death just couldn't hold him. Hallelujah. Because for the first time in the region of darkness, a man without sin stood there and no shackles could hold him down. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says, only the soul that sinned shall what? So when Satan saw the soul that had no sin, he couldn't do anything about it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that is how Jesus presents you today. This is what Jesus presents to God. Look at yourself. I will explain it. Because there's our positional sanctification, and there's also our ongoing sanctification. Look at yourself. Jesus present you to God as righteous, as blameless, as without sin, as without reproach. And so as a Christian who understands that way that God, every day as you wake up, open your eyes, Jesus is presenting you. Jesus is presenting you. I'll explain it. But we need to learn how to present ourselves the way he's presenting us. Hallelujah. This is what we celebrate today. Christ has risen. Christ is making intercession for you. Christ is presenting you before God as victorious, as on top, as blameless, as without reproach. Hallelujah. I don't know how that makes you feel. Amen. I don't know how that makes you feel. The Bible says, Colossians chapter 2, it says, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him. Having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, that was contrary to us, 
and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah. Why do we come to church? Why do we have fellowship? Brethren, listen. There is a need for revelation. There is a need for revelation. The disciples, they all ran when they saw the physical things that was going on. But when revelation began to come, when the Holy Spirit came, they received boldness to take on the nature of what Christ has accomplished. And this Easter, every Easter offers a new beginning, offers you to rise to a new realm, offers you a chance to move to a higher position in your faith. Hallelujah. It is so important that the Holy Spirit came. I'm so excited about the letters that were written. It was a mystery that confused Satan. And Satan is still confused today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This was the greatest gift of God to mankind. That God himself will take on flesh. A body was prepared for him. And he came in the flesh. He knew no sin. And then took our place. But there's something I want to share this morning that's been just turning me around. He chose the nails. Hallelujah. You know, when we look at the cross, what do we see? We look at the cross, what do we see? Hallelujah. We see the gift of God. We see Christ hanging on that cross. We see the crown of thorns on his head. We see our salvation. And many times to us, the cross is all about our salvation. But I want you to know there are so many other things that happened on that cross. Love is expressed through gifts. There are so many gifts that Christ has given to us, symbolized in all that happened on that cross. Three different apostles in their writing talks about this. Paul says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is dead, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That eternal life is a gift and there are many ways it is expressed. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, tells us in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There's an inheritance for you and I. James says, in James chapter 1 verse 17, James tells us, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of shadow of turning. He said, of his own will, verse 18, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Jesus, God, chose the nails. He allowed his head for a crown of thorns to be put there. He opened his hands for the nails to pierce him. His garments were taken off him. His spear was thrust into his side to pierce his heart for blood and water to gush out. 
Do you realize that none of this was necessary for our salvation? Because all that was needed for our salvation was for his blood to drop. Is somebody with me? Please follow me closely. All that was needed for our salvation was for him to shed his blood. He could have shed that blood anyhow. Because the Bible said he had the Holy Spirit without measure. And so in Christ, for the first time, you had the breath. Is there anybody here who can hold your breath for 10 minutes? <laughs> Hallelujah. Our blood takes in oxygen and then, you know, so the blood circulates through. Christ had the Holy Spirit, the breath of God in no measure in him. In other words, Christ was saturated with the Holy Spirit. That was the power in the blood that needed to be shed. Hallelujah. So that the Holy Spirit can now have access, can now have a legal access to come and now live in man. Praise the Lord. Because in the Old Testament, after the fall, the Holy Spirit could not dwell in man. It came upon special people at special times. Is somebody with me? Are you following me? So for the first time, you had someone in a human form who had the Holy Spirit in his fullness without sin. That was why after he resurrected, he had to take that blood to present it in heaven, to present it before the throne of the Father, to say that here is man in his purest form. And that enabled God to now release the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But what I'm saying is that all he needed to do was to shed that blood. But God in Christ Jesus loves you and I so much more. The instruction to the soldiers were, Matthew 27, if you read from verse 26, after Barnabas was freed up, take him to the hill and crucify him. They could have done that, but the soldiers decided to have some fun. Where did it start? The Bible said they spat at him. They spat at him. Now I want you to know that Jesus did not wipe away what they spat at him. Because he had you and I in mind. The what they, they spat at him represented the ugliness in the heart of man. When people spit, they spit out, out of disgust. When they spat at Jesus, this represented the gossip and the slander. It represented the vileness that can come out of man towards you. And Jesus was saying, I take it for you. Is somebody following me? Jesus was saying, I, I take, I will take that for you. He didn't have to go to the cross with that. But he said, from now, there is nothing that anyone can say against you that should be an issue to you. Hallelujah. There are many people that what depresses them is just a, a, an insult. What depresses them, what gets them down is a rejection. He took the venom, he took the hatred so that you and I 
can have the promises of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In everything that Jesus did, there was always something we receive. So you and I can focus on what God has said. And so if there's someone here today and you're still bothered about what somebody said or somebody cursed you or somebody said something against you, hallelujah, Jesus took all that so that you can receive the loving promises and the blessings from God. Then what did they do next? They put crown, a crown of thorns. They took a plant with thorns and they folded it to make a crown and put it on his head. He didn't struggle. They pierced his skull till blood came out. Do you know the significance of that? Because thorns are symbolic of the consequences of sin. Remember when Adam and, um, and Eve sinned in the garden? God said the earth would bring only thorns for them. So thorns represent the consequences of sin. Proverbs 22 verse 5 says, Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. These are things that take place in the mind. The feeling of shame. The feeling of shame. The, the feeling of discomfort, anxiety, feeling disgraced. Sometimes things are going on in our mind as a consequence of our wrongdoing. And that it, it stops us from being able to act out in the fullness of faith. Today I want you to know Jesus took it. He took all those mental issues that are a consequence of sin. Many times we understand that our sins are forgiven, but we cannot forgive ourselves. Because our mind still dwells on it. We still think about it. We remember certain things and then we feel shame. The enemy will attack us with certain thoughts and then we feel less than who we truly are. Jesus wore that crown of thorns for you and I to have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell somebody there's no condemnation to me because I'm in Christ Jesus. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. No more shame. No more disgrace. Your path is a part of grace. And then you know, his hands were nailed. He didn't clench a fist. He was not struggling. He allowed his right hand and his left hand and a mallet with a vicious nail pierced through his hands. You know, be between his hand and the wood of the cross that that nail pierced to hang him up was a long list. It was a long list of your sins and my sins. A long list of our misdeeds, our mistakes. A long list of our regrets. He didn't struggle. The Bible later tells us in Colossians that all the handwritings, all the things, you saw the drama, the drama they were asking, is your name on the list? All the things that will have kept your name out of the book of life, that list, it was nailed in his hand to the cross. He chose those nails. It was a decision. He chose, he chose for you and I. The Bible says, it has blotted out. When I saw the word blotted out, King James says blotted out. 
some other translation is, is wiped out. And so he held your sins and my sins. He held our mistakes. He held those sins that the list of things that will hinder you from access to God. He held it. And as the nail pierced his hand and blood squatted out, we were blotted out. The shedding of his blood coming out of his hands and his legs some of the things we have done with our hands, some of the places we have gone to we shouldn't have, the Bible says they are blotted out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then they put a sign above his head, very interestingly. The sign said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the, 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 the Pharisees, they argued and said, oh, don't don't say that. He only said he only said he is. <laughs> Pilate said, "What I have written, I have written." Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And that was translated in three languages. God can use anyone, and God wants to reach everyone. God used Pilate to evangelize. You know, God used Pilate to evangelize. Hallelujah. God can use anyone, and God wants to reach everyone. Those were the three major languages in those days. It was written in the Hebrew language, which was the language of, of, of religion, the language of Israel. And then it was written in Latin, which was the language of the occupying army, the Romans, the language of law and government, and then it was written in Greek. That was the language of culture. And so Jesus was declared king over religion, over law and government, and over culture in all the known languages at that time. Praise the Lord. Two crosses were planted beside him. It was not coincidence to have those two planted beside him. In actual fact, everything I'm saying now, we are foretold, we are prophecies foretold long before this day. I'm trying to show us the things that happened at that cross that had deeper meaning for you and I that Christ did not just go to that cross for our salvation. He had several gifts with him. Gifts that affected your health. He was beaten, the Bible said, by his stripes were healed. The crown of thorns on his head that we might have the mind of Christ. But these two crosses beside him, they are so important also for us to consider and embrace. Because Christ shows us how he honors us with the power of choice. He honors us with the power of choice. Abel chose God, Cain did not. We find that throughout the Bible. Abraham followed God, Lot went to Sodom. David submitted to God, Saul sought power. Saul was intoxicated with power. Peter and Judas both betrayed Jesus. But Peter repented. Judas went and hung himself. There's always... With God, you are as close to God as you choose to be. And today, that marks a new beginning. I am praying that every one of us, and even as a, as a fellowship, we will choose something based on what Christ has done. Praise the Lord. You can choose to build on sand or on the rock, to serve God or serve mammon. There's always a choice. There's always a choice. And then his garment was divided. The Bible tells us that that garment was seamless. It was woven. 
I wonder how they could weave a garment, take his measurement and weave it in such a way that it had, it, it was seamless. Praise God. There was no way to divide it. The seamlessness of that garment represented his character. And so throughout the Bible, in scriptures, the garment is always symbolic of a person's character. That seamless character was taken from him. He took on the indignity of our own nakedness. Remember that when the glory left Adam, Adam hid and said, I was naked. I hid because I was naked. And so until Christ came, man was still naked. They took the garment from him because he could not present us to God in our nakedness. He had to rob us in his own garment to present us to God. And he took on our own nakedness. He took on the indignity of our nakedness. He took on our sinfulness. He redressed us in a coat of love to present us to God. Hallelujah. Now the big question is, how do we live today as we are presented? Hmm. How do we live today as we are presented? Because what we celebrate today when, when we are excited at Easter is an excitement that certain battles are over in your life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Certain battles are over in your life. What is required for us is to learn how to live in victory. To learn how to what? A spear was thrust into his side. The Bible said it pierced his heart and blood and water came out. And I want to tell you the significance of this because it's so important for us to know. Hallelujah. The spear ruptured his heart, blood and water poured out. As that happened, the curtain of the holiest of all split from top to bottom. Hebrews 10 tells us, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. So the writer of Hebrews was telling us, when his body was pierced, when his body was pierced, when his heart was pierced, the veil was torn. The veil was torn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Through his body, through his body, access has been given eternally for you and I to have relationship with God. You know what the blood represents? The blood represents God's work for us. In that in salvation, we don't do any work. It is the blood of Jesus that flowed, that opened that door. The veil is torn. That veil cannot be put back together. It is impossible for man not to have access to God again. Because as I speak to you now, there is a man in the Godhead. Oh, you didn't get that. <laughs> you didn't get that. Think about it. There's a man with a resurrected body in the Godhead. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, you, you will get it. You will get it. You will get it. You, you will get it. Hallelujah. And so what Christ did 
was permanent, was eternal. Once that blood flowed out, the veil was torn. God said, I will no longer hide my face from you. And so he sits in the Godhead making intercession for us. You know what the water represents? Because the Bible said specifically that blood and water gushed out. The blood represented the work of God in us. The work of God in us. The water represents the work of the Holy Spirit in us. One was the work of God for us. God worked for us on that cross. We didn't have to do anything. The water represents the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And so by water and the blood, he came. Praise God. And so now we can have access because we have a positional sanctification, which is the blood gives us a position with God. That position will never be taken. But the water gives us a progressive sanctification. Let me read, let me read, uh, let me read Ephesians. No, let me read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Please listen, I'm, I'm closing now. But before I close, I want us to do something in celebration of this Easter. So there is a positional sanctification. When anyone receives Jesus, you are positioned. You are positioned as perfect. Christ presents you as perfect. Christ doesn't present you as struggling. When we speak sometimes to Christians, I'm, Pastor, I'm struggling. We are, we are getting there. We are trying. Jesus never presents you that way. Hallelujah. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, and then we are going to start closing. I believe there's lots of food, praise God, to celebrate after this message. Hebrews chapter 10 says from verse 12, but this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who have been sanctified. He has perfected forever, what? He has perfected forever, what? Those who have been sanctified when he was pierced. Christ ensured that not only are you perfected, but that the grace and the help of God will never depart from you in your work of salvation. You see, these are the things that began to come to the disciples long after. The physical thing, the emotions we have when we see the film, we see him being beaten, we see all those things, we feel emotion. The revelation behind those things, they are powerful. I can't go through all. There's the significance of the the, 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 the mire that it was offered, that he refused to take that. And then he took some wine just before he declared, I'm finished. There's so many symbolism there that Christ has done and he will uphold to do till the end of your days. He's someone you can trust in him. You can depend on him. Hallelujah. The Bible said if he went to the cross, if God could give his only begotten son, he said, how much more will he not freely give you all things? Praise the Lord. 
So we can bring all our failures to him. We can bring our disappointments. We can bring our character defects. We can bring our mismanagement. We can bring everything to him, knowing that the blood of Christ has positioned you. Knowing also that the Holy Spirit has been released to perfect you and I in our work. We have the help of the Holy Spirit to work with him. Hallelujah. I want to ask a question. I want us to rise up to our feet. And as we close this, this meeting, and we're going to the communion table, I want you to think about all that Christ brought. All that Christ brought with, with salvation. Not just that we are saved, but he has taken from you the vilest, the ugliest thing anyone could say to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so when you have that knowledge, when you have that understanding, then you have what Peter said are the great and precious promises of God. This is what Christ has brought to you and I. Christ wore the crown of thorns so that your mind can think straight. His hands and feet were nailed so that our own sins and our mistakes can be blotted out. They put a sign over his head so that we can understand we can reign in law, in government, <laughs> in culture. Hallelujah. Then he gave us a choice. His garment was divided so that you can be clothed with robes of royalty. Now, this moment, I want to ask you a question. What are you going to bring to the cross? What are you going to bring to the cross? Is there something in your life right now you need to bring to the cross? Is there something that you have not released that needs to be brought to the cross? As a Christian, hallelujah, we rejoice today because our sins are forgiven. But many times there are things we hold there in our heart. There are hurts, there are wounds, there are pains, there are things that we refuse to let go, even though Christ has taken them. There are sicknesses you have accepted, you don't have to. There is a choice today. You can be healed. By his stripes you were healed. Hallelujah. There are mental anguish and things we remember that still brings pain to us today. Every pain can be relieved. Every emotional trauma can be healed. Today is the day of a new beginning. I said today is the day of a new beginning. A new beginning in your life. A new beginning in your marriage. A new beginning in your finances. A new beginning. A new beginning. Wherever you need a new beginning, today is the day. But to have a new beginning, there are certain things you must let go. If I stretch out my hand and I say, take, you cannot take without an open hand. Is there something you need to let go? Let this Easter be a day that you let go and you let God. Speak to God in a minute, and then we are going to pray. Speak to God in a minute. This is the beginning of victory. 
This is the beginning of wisdom, replacing every kind of foolishness. This is the beginning of wealth, replacing poverty. For you are redeemed from every curse. This is the beginning of fruitfulness. This is the beginning. What are the new beginnings you want? These are the things that God guarantees us as we come to Passover. And so everything that is not of God will pass over you. But you have a choice. It's not enough that someone is praying for you. What choices are you making today? Will you make a choice? Will you make a choice for greatness? Will you make a choice and refuse mediocrity? Will you make a choice today? What choice do you make? Do you make a choice for long life? Do you make a choice for health? Will you choose Jesus? Will you make a choice? Make that choice today because God will stand by whatever choice you make. I have questioned, I said, why didn't Jesus, you know, Jesus went, why didn't Jesus talk to the other man on the other side? One man had lived a lifetime of errors, a lifetime of evil, and he made only one decision, and he entered heaven. Just one decision, one right choice, out of how many, only God knows how many hundreds of wrong choices that man made. One right choice. Today you will make the right choice. And I have said, Lord, why didn't Jesus turn to the other one and said, if you repent too. And I understand that sometimes, sometimes God will speak to us. Sometimes God's voice will sound like thunder. At other times, God can even lay us with breakthrough. We'll give you breakthrough. We'll give you a breakthrough. We'll give you breakthrough finance. Give you a big job and say, come close to me. At other times, he will just be silent. At other times, he'll be what? He will just be silent. To the other man, he was silent. God will not be silent to you. Every choice you make in prayer today, may the Lord grant the desires of your heart. Every change you need. I want to say, I want to do something. You know, we're always pressured for time, but I'm rounding up now. The altar is the place of transformation. Jesus was the lamb. The cross was the altar. He came and he died on that altar. And then something changed spiritually forever. I want as many, please listen to me very carefully. It's symbolic. Sometimes we do physical things, but the spiritual significance is profound. I will want you to approach God with boldness. If there is anything, anything at all in your life that has been a struggle that you know this cannot it cannot go with me into this new year after this Easter. I want you to come to the altar and stand here before God and say Lord as I come here, it marks a new beginning. And what that new beginning looks like, I want you to define it before God. I want you to come and say, I lay down, I lay down, I lay down this struggle. I lay down this sin. I lay down this mismanagement of time. I lay down, whatever it is, lay it down. Lay it down before him. And then arise spiritually with new grace, new strength in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's just worship. My chains are gone.
Les calaprosota casse qui y est les brozo préquete li a casata. Les brocoso préquata la casata. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. Today we mark this day. We mark this day. We mark this day. Les calaprosota qui est we humble ourselves at this cross, at this junction, in space and time. We mark this day in space and time, embracing the grace at the throne of grace. We come to the throne of grace. We are not ashamed to call you God. We come to the throne of grace today. Ne kale prosota kasata. Ye keke le prosondaria kapa kasata. Jesus, Son of God, ne kale prosota kaparata. See our brokenness today. Le kezata le prosota. That in you we will rise up in victory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you are watching this program online, I want you to symbolically step forward. I want you to symbolically step forward, step towards the throne of God. issue in the hands of Jesus. The one who through the water is still perfect in all that concerns us. And today I can assure you as God is God, as Jesus is Savior, as the Holy Spirit is helper, that the help that comes from heaven will find you. One on this altar, you have come to the place of transformation. It is not the pastor that transforms you, it is the Almighty God to whom you have come in submission. And today, by the power of the Almighty God, I declare a divine transformation in everything that needs to change as we bow before God, as we celebrate the resurrection power of Jesus today. Lord, we give you the glory. Lord, we give you the glory. Lord, we give you the glory. We celebrate your majesty. You give beauty for ashes. You replace every sorrow with joy. And if there are people here today that there is any kind of infirmity in your body, today receive your healing. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Receive your liberty in the name of Jesus. Liberty from poverty in the name of Jesus. Liberty from control in the name of Jesus. Liberty from every character trait that has held you back in the name of Jesus. Healing rain is falling down. Father, we give you glory. We give you the praise. I'm not afraid. It is done. It is I'm done. Not afraid. It is done. Healing Let me say this. For everyone listening online, for everyone who has not come out, there's a divine exchange. But for people who have come out here, you have come acknowledging the one who perfects all things. 
and I'm assured in my heart. The Bible says nothing comes to pass except the Lord has commanded it. The Lord who commanded this. Before this year is over, you will almost not recognize yourself. Because the Lord will do a work in you that only He can source, only He can resource, and only He can take the glory in the name of Jesus. Please rise up to your feet. Rise into the newness of life. Rise into the victory that is ordained for you. Rise to eat at the table that has been prepared for you. Rise and march unto victory in life in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for the Lord. Put your hands together for the Lord. As a fellowship, we are starting something new today. It's a new beginning. Hallelujah. God commanded me. And um, it's something that I've been, I've been asking again and again for quite a while. And God said, start now. And so we are starting our healing school. Amen. Listen, by the grace of God, I have seen, I have seen all kinds of healing on the mission field. I have seen God. I have seen God. I have seen God. And I know God. And so God said, start. He said, if you don't create the atmosphere, you are not giving me the chance to do what I do. Hallelujah. And so we're going to start healing school. Bring the sick. Hallelujah. Bring the oppressed. They are not coming to pastor. Amen. Amen. They are coming to the God that pastor knows. Hallelujah. And God will be glorified. Amen. And so in doing that, we are initiating what I call a prayer grid. And we're, we're going to be launching that from the 1st of April. And I want everyone to be part of it. Amen. Everyone to be part of it. And in that prayer grid, by the grace of God, Everyone in this fellowship will have at least three people praying for you every day. At least. Amen. At least. At least three people will have you on a prayer altar on a daily basis. Are you ready for that? That's the new beginning. That's the new beginning that God is telling me. God is talking to me about revival. And God is talking to me about prayer. And God is talking to me about healing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you ready, church? Will you cooperate with me? Will you cooperate with the Holy Spirit? Will you pray when you are asked to pray? For people you are not close to. For people in the body, will you make that pledge with me? We are making the pledge before God right now as a family. The instructions will go out. The grid will go out. It's a commitment that this Easter, as a fellowship, we commit to praying for one another. Will you make that commitment with me? Can you say with me today? As we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, I commit myself to love and to act in love by praying 
For whoever is assigned to me to pray for. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory! Oh, my heart is so glad. I can feel the genuineness of that. My heart rejoices. My heart rejoices. It's a new day. Let's go to the communion table. My heart really rejoices. Please, you may have your seats. My heart, my heart is glad. My heart rejoices. First Corinthians 11. Paul had this revelation. Therefore, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, I took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so what we celebrate today, in his death, he destroyed our death. In the resurrection, we have new life. Now, let me emphasize this. This new life we receive in Jesus it's a life that can only be lived in love. In John chapter 13, Jesus said, only one commandment I give to you, love one another. And so what I'm instructing us to do, I want you to understand it from the, from the dimension of the new covenant. When you are in this body, you can no longer live alone for yourself. Please understand what I'm saying. Something is about to happen in this place. And it will take the cooperation of all of us. One commandment, I mean two ordinances that Jesus, one commandment, two ordinances that Jesus left. The one commandment is the commandment, love one another. Praise God. Love one another. If I'm praying for you, I can't think ill of you. If I'm praying for you, I can't think evil of you. If I'm praying for you, I won't gossip about you. If I'm praying for you, I won't slander you. And if we are praying for one another, then God's power will move in our midst in, in amazing ways. And then this communion is an ordinance forever as well as water baptism. And when we come to this table, we come to celebrate that he died. He actually died. And in his death, he took death from us. And we have a new life. That life is a life that is lived in love. That life is maintained by love. And so as we partake of this communion, we are starting our 21 days of fasting for the new quarter. And like I said, in January, the seed from our offerings in those 21 days went to a charity, a homeless charity. These next 21 days, our offerings will be going to Gaza and uh, Ukraine. Hallelujah. By the grace of God. The seed that we collect 
as we fast, as we deny ourselves food, that money you're supposed to use to eat, amen, praise God, it will be a collection. Because we are the light of the world, we are the salt in the world. As we are praying, we are praying for those places where there is conflict in those different places. The two major ones now, uh, these ones I have mentioned. We want to sow a seed of peace there. We want to sow a seed for, you know, it could be tiny, it could be just a, 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 a widow's might. But whatever it is, as we fast and pray, for whatever God wants to do in our lives, we're going to remember places and people who right now are in situations that only God can intervene. And God will be glorified. And so, Lord, we partake of this communion. And I pray that through this communion, shed abroad your love in our heart. Lord, give us a capacity for love so that we can do the work that is in our future. It was love that kept Jesus going. It was love that led him to the cross. It was love that enabled him to finish his assignment. I pray as we partake of this communion that each one here will so operate in the love that the Holy Spirit brings that you will complete your assignment. You will fulfill your purpose in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you. We rejoice in your mighty resurrection today and your ascension to heaven. We look forward to your return. For you said the same way you ascended, the same way you will come. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is here to help us to live like you. As we share this body and your blood, may we praise and glorify your name forever. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen.